Tick tock, tick tock. Stability test is coming up. Or is it? Let's find out. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. Just like death and taxes, stability tests are certain, but rarely specific. And the government always seems to have a say in the matter. Following that idea of taxes, stability tests go better when you plan for them and anticipate government regulations. So today I want to highlight the schedule for stability tests, when you need them, and what are your options when it comes due. Before we get into this too far, I need to limit the scope of the discussion. You see, stability tests heavily involve regulatory bodies. They resemble a tax audit more than a scientific experiment. In order to run a smooth stability test, you need to know the politics, history, and attitudes of each nation's regulator. I don't know every nation in the world, so for this article, I'm limiting my experience solely to working with the United States Coast Guard, USCG. Before we get bogged down talking about regulations, I want to first explain two important ideas that underpin much of the stability test requirements. Once you understand the logic behind these two ideas, all the other regulations seem more sensible. The first idea is aggregate weight change. The word aggregate weight change appears in many regulations surrounding stability tests. Now, when you hear aggregate weight change, the importance is not the physical change in light chip weight. We use aggregate weight change as a method to keep score of the risk behind the light chip weight. And that's also why I'm italicizing in this presentation, to remind you that this represents a risk, not a physical weight. Well, what do I mean by risk? Think about the history of your light ship weight. Every time you added or removed a permanent item to the ship, there was always a risk that we didn't really know what the weight of that item was. Take, for example, a new winch on the deck. Well, you may know the shipping weight, but then it has to be secured to the deck. How much did the welding add to that weight? What about the paint job once you get it all cleaned up? Every change to the ship comes with a little uncertainty. Over time, those tiny variations add up to the point where the total effect could potentially shift your light ship by a fairly large amount. That is the risk that we focus on when we're calculating aggregate weight change. Good news is you can calculate this yourself. In normal weight calculations, we have additions and subtractions to the vessel. But remember that aggregate weight change is a risk, not a weight. We can only increase the risk, not decrease it. If you're going to add a new weight to the vessel, that is a positive aggregate weight change. If you're going to remove a new weight from the vessel, i.e. subtracting weight, that's still a positive aggregate weight change because you've made a change that increases the risk. And if you're actually moving an item from one location to another on your vessel permanently, you actually have to count that twice for aggregate weight change because there were two opportunities for risk in your weight. The next idea I want to talk about is the weight history. You see, I've been talking about the ship changing its weight over its lifespan. And that's an assumption on my part. That's an assumption that everybody is going to make. Ships always change their weight over the lifespan of the vessel. It does sound odd to say that small changes can lead to trouble, but I want you to consider a few examples of how you can have undocumented weight changes that are just floating around with your vessel that you don't know about. First, I want you to imagine a best case scenario. Imagine that you own a vessel for 10 years and the master keeps detailed records of any permanent weight changes. In this scenario, it should be impossible to have any unknown weight changes. Wonderful. But who owned the vessel before you? Did they keep detailed records? Another classic example is paint. From an operations perspective, you may discount paint as a weightless object something applied in small patches to maintain the hull and prevent corrosion. But look at a shipyard crew as they paint the entire hull of a ship. Imagine the pallets full of paint feeding those sprayers. 
Can you lift all of that weight by hand? Normally it's trucked in by the truck load, handled by forklifts and cranes. Paint adds several tons worth of weight. Now let's imagine you're a ship owner that every year wants to renew the coat of paint on their vessel. Every year you're adding several tons to the weight of your vessel. As you can see, small changes are deceptive and nearly impossible to pinpoint. And this is why regulations simply assume that a ship will always increase in weight over time, which is why we occasionally need to run stability tests to check it. Given these two assumptions, regulations look for ways to reduce the risk and ensure that vessels remain stable throughout their entire working life. Thankfully, we do get a little leniency in the area of required tests. There are three different types of tests associated with stability, each with their own limitations. First up is the lightweight survey. The lightweight survey consists of a deadweight survey plus a freeboard reading. If you're not familiar with these terms, go check out my other video on what is a stability test, where I define all of these words. The table below summarizes the output from a lightweight survey. This test does leave out one critical element, the vertical center of gravity, VCG. The main appeal to this test, though, is cost savings. Without the VCG, we don't need an incline experiment. No requirements for expensive crane rentals or incline weights, all of that is left out. Lightweight surveys are very attractive in that regard because they present a low budget solution when some type of test is required. Next up is the full stability test. Most ships will require a full stability test at least once in their lifetime. This includes everything in the lightweight survey plus an incline experiment. The table summarizes the results available from a full stability test. And this is basically everything. Stability tests provide all the information that the naval architect requires for the light ship. The trade-off is cost. Stability tests are large, complicated affairs requiring coordination of several parties, including shipyards, crane operators, and ship personnel. Now, I don't want that to scare you off because they are well worth it. Think of them as an investment in your ship's safety. Finally up is the simplified stability test. Now, don't get too excited about this one because it's a very small subcategory of ships that are even permitted to use this type of test. The simplified stability test only applies to certain smaller vessels. So what's the major difference here? Well, the previous two tests assumed that you had extensive documentation and drawings for your vessel. Those drawings are necessary to complete the test, but smaller vessels may not have that documentation. Instead of determining the light ship, this test takes the criteria of the stability analysis and tests them directly on the vessel. We calculate the anticipated healing moments for the vessel from two major sources, passenger crowding on one side and wind healing moment. Taking the larger of the two, we reproduce that healing moment directly on the vessel. The vessel passes if it does not heal beyond certain limits. Table on your screen highlights the limitations for a simplified stability test. And you can see it's almost a reverse of our other two tests. What we're getting now is a live version of a stability analysis, but we are not getting any of the information about the light ship. So if you plan to alter the vessel, this test provides none of that necessary information to predict the new light ship weight after your alterations. My major warning here is that you should discuss the trade-offs of a simplified stability test with your naval architect. Although you may be permitted to go down this route, it may not be the most cost-effective route for you, depending on what project you're working on with your vessel. Hey, speaking of your next project, did you know that DMS provides stability testing services? One of the unique things that we deliver is fast results. This is something that I've worked on with the computer automation. You sign up with DMS, I'm going to have preliminary results for you right there on the day of the test. Full results are available within a few days after I perform quality control. So it doesn't matter if it's an incline experiment, stability test, light ship survey, dead weight survey, we can help with all of this. Are you ready to make your next stability project easy? Check out the website and give us a call. And back to stability tests. 
So far, I've talked quite a bit about the different types and what the options are. Now let's get into the guts of the regulations. Several times I've indicated that regulations will stipulate when you need a stability test. So what's the schedule? Every two months, every six years, every 50 years? Thankfully, USCG does not punish you with unnecessary tests. Rather than a prescriptive schedule, test requirements were driven by weight changes. There are two criteria that can require a test. Now, I should also mention that there are some special cases for criteria, specifically for passenger vessels. If you want to learn more about that, you should read the article that goes along with this video on the DMS website. Link to that is in the description below. So the first weight-driven criteria is based upon aggregate weight change. If the aggregate weight change does not exceed 2% of the current light chip weight, then no tests are required at all. You're scot-free. Once you go over that 2% limit, one of two tests will be required. If you're in the range of 2 to 10%, you only need a lightweight survey. If you're already over an aggregate weight change of 10%, then you have no choice. Full stability test is required. It's that 2 to 10% realm that can get you into trouble. Most owners are tempted to go with a lightweight survey and try to save some money. But you have to be careful, because there's a second requirement that can trip you up. If you perform a lightweight survey, and if the Coast Guard is comparing the results of that survey with your old light ship weight, if they show that your new survey has changed by more than 1% from your old light ship weight, then Coast Guard will still require a full stability test. Notice the difference there. The previous limits of 2 to 10% compared aggregate weight change, but results from the lightweight survey compare actual weight change. So when you're trying to make this business decision, the risk behind a lightweight survey is paying for the added cost of a full stability test. You're paying for two things instead of just one. Now there's one other rule that can also trigger a stability test. In addition to the weight changes, the regulations also worry about the LCG changing. That's your longitudinal center of gravity. When reviewing the results of a lightweight survey, the new LCG needs to be within 1% of the old LCG. If your LCG shifted by more than 1%, again, you need a full stability test. And now there is one final weight criteria, something that I like to call the dummy clause. Occasionally, certain vessels are ridiculously simple, and we can demonstrate safe stability plus a huge margin for error. In these cases, the exact location of the weight and center of gravity becomes less critical. With a larger margin for error, USCG becomes more lax in their requirements for stability tests hence what I call the dummy clause. Instead, you may be able to satisfy them with simple weight and moment calculations. Let's wrap things up. First, we have a major concept that I want to make sure everyone understands. It's that every time you see the word aggregate weight change, don't think about weight. Think that aggregate weight change equals risk. And that risk is important because that helps us decide which of the three tests we're going to use. Your options are a lightweight survey, a full stability test, or a simplified stability test, which is really a special case. And now when you're digging into the regulations asking whether or not you need a stability test, the good news is that there are generally no prescribed intervals. It's weight-based, and there are three major rules that you need to know about. The 2% aggregate weight change, the 1% change in your actual weight, not your aggregate weight, and then the 1% shift in your LCG. And if you're really lucky, you won't even have to do any of that, and you'll just fall under the dummy clause where no stability test at all is required. I've only skimmed over the regulations for stability tests. So if you want someone to help you who really understands these rules, you can always hire DMS to guide you through your next stability test. Because certain is the sea, Ships will require stability tests at some point in their life. Or maybe not. As we've discovered, 
the regulations recognize that a stability test is a huge expense. They employ performance-based criteria to only require tests when absolutely necessary. Even then, you typically have options to, to decide on the type of test that you want. The rules surrounding stability tests, they try to balance safety against cost, aiming for a happy medium to keep your ship on the water and operating safely. Thanks very much. I'm Nick the Naval Architect. I've got a secret for you. Anytime you see me showing something on video, I have services available that are way better than what you see for free. So check out the website to find out how I can make your next project easier.